Welcome to another episode of Code for Thought. After three years, the RSE conference is back as an in-person event and I was absolutely thrilled to go to Newcastle in September and be able to meet those of you I've met only online so far. The organising committee kindly gave me some time to run a live podcast session on the first conference day. The theme for the recording was RSE the next 10 years. It comes at the right time as we celebrate the 10th anniversary of research software engineering this year 2022. One thing that struck me during the panel discussion and in fact in some of the sessions at the conference is that 10 years on we are still concerned about recognition, role definition and career paths and futures. For sure in countries like the UK RSEs have increased in numbers but the role still struggles for recognition. This seems to be in contrast with the private sector, or at least part of the sector, where software engineering has been recognised and playing an important part in the success of businesses for a long time. Still, the last 10 years have laid the foundation to research software engineering in countries like the UK, and other countries are now following suit. And there's an opportunity to cement software engineering as an integral part in academia and research. This has been my first RSE conference. It has also been the first time I recorded an episode with a live audience, and as a consequence you might hear some glitches. So, without further ado, let's go to the recording. Actually, that shows that uh, we are live in the audience, so over to you. Okay, so I think if we're showing up here with two different microphones, that's a little bit weird, but I think I need to ask the panel members to actually take microphones when they're speaking, because we have actually one that goes into the speakers and one that goes into the recording device. But with me here today is a very exciting and eclectic cloud, uh, crowd, and uh, one which is Idil Ostemir from uh, UCL. There's Simon Hetrick, who many of you will know and from the SSI, and then there's Jennifer Richards from Newcastle University coming and interrupting a holiday. So I think a special <laughs> applause for her, please. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Annika Cawthon, and who's also a colleague of mine at UCL, and Michael James from the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council uh, of the UKRI. So thank you very much for attending. The subject today is RSE the next 10 years. And so maybe I can start with you, Jennifer. <laughs> because I think you've worked with RSEs before for a while and I heard through the grapevine you're quite an enthusiastic supporter. It would be good to know why and uh, also how you see it going forward. Hello, everybody. I should explain that I came back from my holiday yesterday, so I, but I appreciated the round of applause anyway. <laughs> um, so let me just tell you a little bit about myself, because I'm not a software engineer. I'm uh, based in the School of English. I'm a literary scholar, and I work on historical material. And about maybe six, seven years ago, um, I got funding from the university to link up with data science and software engineering and to try and move forward disciplines in the um, traditional humanity, so text-based archival work. But I have to say, I have only nice things to say about software engineers. I love working with software engineers, I really do. From the moment when I was introduced to the software engineering team at Newcastle and saw how they worked, and this follows on from the last talk, I saw how they worked together in a collaborative way to solve problems. I did feel this is a group of people I want to be with and learn from. Mm -hmm. So we've done quite a lot of work, and I'll wrap this up, we've done quite a lot of work, quite a lot of experimental work with the, uh, to try and get humanities colleagues understanding what mm. software engineering involves. And I suppose the key thing for me, the key point that I would really like to get across is that we really enjoy thinking with software engineers. We might say a bit more about that later. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, so following up from that, so that means a very more collaborative approach rather than just going to the software engineer, hey, give me a website. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Not interested in that. It's a, a research culture thing for mm -hmm. us. 
It's about you, you, you do go with your idea, and you do, uh, software, my colleagues in software engineering can do things I cannot do. Mm. So it's, it feels like a bit of magic sometimes to me. But it's the, and having something to show at the end of it is, for, for us is really important. But it's the thinking you do along the way. For us, um, the people we work with in software engineering mm. are co-researchers, and we want to think with them. It's as simple as that. Okay, well, thank you very much. Annika, if I can home in on you next, because I think you're a colleague and you started quite recently. So uh, how's the experience been for you and what do you expect? What would you like to see in future? Yeah, hello, everyone. My name is Annika. I started a bit more than a year. Yeah, one and a half years, close to. Um, I had a journey through academia, the public service and the private sector. And I hadn't quite found the right thing for me, so I thought oh, I'll go back to academia and see what research software engineering holds for me. And I have to say that I really enjoy the variety that my daily job offers me and that I can go into projects that aren't necessarily the domain that I study. And I can learn technologies that are varied, I guess, where I think I would like to head to in future is the ability to be a specialist in an area. So what I think we are very good is having diversity and having a lot of things that are on our plates, but I also think that we could turn around much more if we had the ability of specializing and basically have specialist sources that we can draw, draw mm -hmm. onto. Okay. So, Michael, I'm looking at you now. So, because I think the EPSRC and UKRI actually played a pivotal role in creating, actually, research software engineering, uh, as we know it. There's the fellowship, and that enabled roles to be created. And so, uh, what kind of funding opportunities, or not fun funding opportunities, but how do you see that moving forward in future? To start with, I would say, in general, we in, intend to, you know, continuing uh, as we have been and Im improving um, going forwards, not just from EPSRC's perspective, but from across UKRI. I talked to colleagues before um, coming mm. on to do this podcast, and everyone is keen to keep supporting research software engineers. Mm -hmm. And and you'll see that in the published documents that we have. So there's the five-year UKRI strategy and the delivery plans for each of the councils published recently also um, put forward the importance of um, investing in people and uh, including in that uh, research software engineers. In terms of how we will specifically fund things moving forwards, I think the idea is in the past we've run three rounds of uh, research software engineering fellowships mm. um, in the uh, Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. The idea behind that was sort of showing the art of the possible and um, beginning to bring about culture change. Since the last most recent rounds of um, research software engineering fellowships, we've moved to a scheme um, called Open Fellowships in EPSRC, mm -hmm. and uh, research software engineers are eligible to apply. So it's about integrating research software engineers within our sort of standard um, practice. One thing that we're uh, doing is to really highlight in the eligibility that, um, well, we say lecturer or equivalent, and you know that that does mean research software engineers, but also highlighting in more specificity that actually um, you are eligible to apply to fellowships. So it's it's not about, I think, moving forwards, uh, working on um, bespoke funding opportunities for research software engineers. It's more about integrating them in in the wider. Um, funding opportunities that we have, and that's for two reasons, really. Something that uh, we, we can't um, devote resources um, forever for bespoke mm -hmm. funding opportunities for different groups, um, but second, on a philosoph philosophical level, um, we would like to integrate them into our sort of standard processes and um, show that uh, research software engineers are eligible for our standard processes. <laughs> okay, good. Uh you know, very nice to see you, and uh, you joined um, UCL recently as well. So what was your path to become a research engineer? Yes, so I joined very recently, as in, um, I think it's been about four months since I've joined yeah. the team, so <laughs> very recently. Uh, my path has been, well, I still consider it quite 
at the beginning of the path, but I've joined the team after about two years of experience working with startups in research and development. And before that, I had some very brief sort of uh, research experience in academia, just getting my life sciences degree and following that up with some lab-based work. Yeah, my experience has been <laughs> great so far. I mean, I've definitely been, you know, following my interest in, in research and to realize certain issues with it that followed me into the startup ecosystem to think that the sort of structure in startups and uh, maybe in the industry can better give the resources to, to better the research mm. only to actually by listening to this podcast to learn about the concept of research software engineering, you know, being interested in this uh, mm. yeah, <laughs> space to solve actually those issues then which led me to join the team. So, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Simon, last but not least. So you've been here from the beginning, actually. So you've seen the advances we've made in research software engineering and the community we've built. What's in store for the next 10 years? So what still needs to be done? In brief. <laughs> <laughs> How much time do you have? Yeah. Uh, I, I think, first of all, we have to say something about your podcast, Creating a Convert to RSE. That's quite, that's quite a success. <laughs> we, we need more of that, I think. Um, so I, I think I, I was, I've been trying to think about this quite a lot over, over this year, because obviously it has been this really important year for us, with it being uh, 10 years for RSE. Um, and you know, the, the initial thing, I think, is that it's very easy. We're, we're 10 years in now, and we're not a new community. We're not the sort of new young thing on the block which you know, sort of generates that excitement that, that we used to have. And, you know, when we first sort of started off, we were amazed if we did anything. You know, you've written a blog post, that's amazing. You know, mm. like we've done something here. And now we're getting much more introspective and looking at the things where maybe we didn't do as well, or looking at the things we, we could have done better in the future and all this sort of thing. So I, I think it's very easy to become too self-critical at that stage. I think we need to really maintain the enthusiasm and the passion that has mm -hmm. created this massively successful worldwide, very large community. Um, we need to continue that in the next 10 years because a lot of our work is still volunteer-led and without that, we don't have volunteers. On that front, <laughs> I want to say two other things that I think are really important. One thing is we have, in a way, too many volunteers. We need more paid-for positions mm -hmm. supporting yeah. this community. We shouldn't just be requiring people to do the extra work to support it. And then I think the, the other thing that's been on, on my mind a lot, especially of late, because I'm doing a lot of recruitment, is that we need more investment and more resources invested into creating new research software engineers. We've been a bit too good at bringing mm -hmm. these people into the community, and we're starting to saturate the market. So we need more research software engineers being trained, rather than having to just evolve as they usually do as PhD mm -hmm. students who learn these techniques and then, and then become RSEs. Mm -hmm. So um, following up from that a little bit, so you said training for research software engineers. How would that be different from training a software engineer? So what makes a research software engineer so special in your case? I think that the, the, the major difference is that you are dealing in a constantly changing environment. So when, I, when I'm talking, working with my RSE group here in Southampton, what you find is that you'll talk to researchers and they don't have an end goal in mind. They mm. have a kind of general direction. So it's taking your software engineering abilities and applying it in a sort of fairly agile way to slowly build up towards a, a, the solution that they want mm -hmm. ultimately, fully in the knowledge that they might completely change their mind halfway through and you have to work with that. So it's taking software engineering and adding this understanding of the incentives and the, uh, the sort of drivers behind research so that you can work in collaboration with a researcher rather than just coming in as a software engineer, being handed the project and delivering mm. it at the end of that project. There's a lot of collaboration with scientists like you, Jennifer, but there's also a lot of going on, say, a researcher comes to you and say, well, here's a website I want to do. And how do we get them out, actually? How do we get them to collaborate more than just treating research software engineering as a service? Because if we're just a service, why not go to an agency? 
think that's the key question, actually. Um, I, don't know, I don't know whether I'd have a really good answer to that. I do think that it, it's a bit like what happens with... Um, so I'm in humanities. Um, I'm, I run the Humanities Research Centre, and I work with artists as well. So it's exactly the same problem that we have, especially the artists, that they're add-on at the end of somebody's project. So mm. can you do some engagement for us rather than core to the thinking that, um, that they want to do and we want to do? So we're well aware of that problem, and that is not good research for us. But I think it's the, the basic solution to that problem is um, education. And I actually mm. think that UKRI, UKRI has a role to play in that. So for me, working with uh, software developers as uh, collaborators it's really important for getting good results and good research. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely take the point about um, specialism. So we might talk a bit later about that in uh, humanities. But I, I do think, so in my community, people don't really understand software engineering. And I think that giving people the opportunity to work and collaborate, and that does mean investment from mm. within universities. I think ha seeing software engineering, for me, as at the heart of doing proper interdisciplinary research, that for me is this real story that we need to make collectively. Yeah, uh, this is a nice segue into the uh, question that I actually have for Michael, because interconnection or uh, collaboration between different sciences, interdisciplinary is uh, the word that you used. Uh, that's kind of difficult when you try to apply for a grant at UKRI, because it's kind of very specific, isn't it? So you do engineering and there's a humanities well well which lot does that for, fall in i mean you mentioned something like open fellowship is that kind of addressing is that going into that direction we uh, are trying to break down the barriers between count the research councils and and mm -hmm. that i mean led to the formation of uk back in i think 2015 and it's a work in progress to to continue to break down those barriers um for example the excalibur program um it's across UKRI, and that's for exascale software um, f funding, but that includes some upskilling of research software engineers, and that is delivered by EPFRC, but is across UKRI remit. Mm. And then uh, in the next few years, we're going to be investing in digital research infrastructure, which includes in people, and that is a cross UKRI program, and we've been, so far, we, we've had quite a collaborative approach to um, building a digital research infrastructure that is spanning um, the UKRI remit. Okay. Specialism is a word, I think, Annika, that you used. There's a need to be a little bit of a specialist rather than a being a generalist. And I think that's a question that actually I have in mind when I think about RSE, because I'm an RSE as UCL as well. And uh, we have a team which I would call probably being generalists, right? Mm -hmm. So, but then there are people that work embedded. Like, for instance, we had a talk uh, we heard this morning, for instance, from Neil Ferguson, who has a team of epidemiologists working closely with software engineers. Mm -hmm. So, where do you see this going uh, in future? So, I think just as generally for everybody on the panel, shall we become? Uh, specialists, shall we become generalists, or where is it going, the whole thing? Annika. I think there needs to be separate approaches in my mind, because if I have a small team where two or three people respond to every demand, then I don't think I can afford having too many specialists, because then I could only answer to specialist needs. So in my mind, where I have bigger teams, there is a different question because there is much higher demand on the team generated over time, which is why there are more people. But I would also think that then you have the opportunity to streamline, to streamline how projects are addressed, how projects are delivered, which I think is a benefit for everyone. It's a benefit for the researcher who wants to have results and wants to have publications, but it's also good for the team because you are motivated by the projects, mm. you get through the projects you answer well. And I think that you can only do once you are a specialist. So the specialists can move in the background across the different projects, and then you have a generalist that perhaps move around and talk to researchers. I also am of the opinion that not everyone has to be a project manager, because I think there are people that are good in this role and that should uh, 
you know, lift this role and uh, talk to people. And I also think that people that can make technical decisions should do the technical decisions. Jennifer, so, sorry if I home in on you <laughs> uh, a little bit, but would you prefer to see actually somebody embedded in your team and in your faculty as a software engineer, or would you be happy to continue, say, having an RSE team in Newcastle University oh, that I you know like to go to? I would like the RSE team to continue as it is, but, to, but for there to be strong links from across the faculties with people with different... I mean, in a way, where's Mark now? I don't want him to... Think he's, he's, left he's just left. I think that the way in which they sh the way in which I imagine they share their knowledge. So mm. now they have people with arts and humanities backgrounds in their team, and that is incredibly important to somebody like me. Our data is slightly different to an epidemiologist. <laughs> and we say it's um, it's. Um, tends to be small and complicated. I know everybody thinks their data is complicated, but, um, but actually having somebody who can explain that, but where they can have a conversation with other people mm -hmm. who might um, d d help you collectively find solutions for particular problems. That seems to me an ideal scenario. There's many different ways of looking at this, of course, and, uh, and I think you, you, know, you need the generalists, especially when you start off as a small group or when you're, mm -hmm. um, you're, you're in a in a research group and embedded RSE, but you're working for multiple different researchers because because there isn't enough call and the specialist demands for you to be able to use that that specialism all the time. And the worst thing I, in the world I find is being being a specialist who's brought in and then never gets to use their specialism. You know, you're just constantly <laughs> stuck being this generalist. So, um, but as we've seen the demand for RSE grow, then we're seeing specialisms grow alongside it because you mm. can actually become a specialist in a particular area in a particular domain or with te particular techniques or even like, you know, with different like, aspects of the research software engineering mm -hmm. such as project management. I'd love to have some specialist people managers, actually. That's what I would really mm. like to have. So you have those sort of different factors at play and you've got to balance out dependent on the, the demand for your, your research software engineering services that, that's coming in. And I think there's, also, there's always that risk. You, know, you can be a generalist that eat gr eats grass or you can be a specialist that only eats bamboo and you're always, you, know, you might have carved out this specialist niche where you're going to work but then you're always a little worried that that person mm. isn't going to be sustained in the long term if that demand goes away. So you, you need a mix of when my answer to everything when people say, should we have this or this in RSE, <laughs> it's always both. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. So, which brings us to the question sort of that I want to touch on next. So, there are two big areas, really. One of which is training, which we already talked a little bit about, because how do we train people up? Because at least in our group, and I'm not quite sure what the audience experience is, we get people from the industry who worked in different areas before they joined RSE teams, but we also get people who finish, say, their university, their PhD, and go as uh, RSEs. So the training needs, obviously, are a little bit different, depending on who it is that joins. But you touched on a very important point, because to software engineering, there isn't just sort of, you know, writing the line of code. There is also managing projects. There's the communication with the, uh, the PIs and the researchers. And then, of course, there's a line manager. So how do we get all that together? I'm Peter. I just finished my PhD. Where the hell do I start? Um, maybe I can speak to that as someone that very recently joined <laughs> okay. the team. Uh, my experience with like being, I consider myself in training right now in a certain way, even mm. though you are my colleagues. Um, I find that experience through uh, being in teams in which um, I am working with colleagues whose experiences and expertise uh, in a way is giving me an opportunity to, to you know, learn from that expertise and pick up on those skills. So in that way, like training for me also means a lot uh, about um, having a great line manager and having a great yeah, supervision team that makes sure that in the um, projects that I'm joining, I am joining a blended uh, pool of expertise that is giving me a safe space to kind mm -hmm. of pick up on those skills and do my own training and, and develop over time with them while I'm also uh, delivering the work, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it's a, a plea for a diversity of teams, so you need to have yeah. basic sort of 
experienced people that also meant be able to mentor to the newer ones. Yes, I, I think, mm -hmm. yeah, um, that has been my experience so far that has helped me, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, is there a more structured way? Sort of do we actually need to have, say, project management training for research software engineers or line management training? So what's your feel about that? Yes, I think we definitely do. Whenever you look at the, the results of the RSE survey that we run around about every two years, we say, mm -hmm. well, the top three skills you want to learn um, as an RSE to help you with your work, and you'd expect it all to be coding-related stuff, but about half of it is soft skills of some form or other, so it's project management, client mm -hmm. management. It's things like, you know, that Dave was talking about earlier on, coping with the stress of work and, 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 and all of these different aspects, and, and you know, and then way down the list, something to do with coding. So I think we definitely need courses for that. But before we can do that, we really need to invest a lot of time and effort into collecting what the community wants so that we're not just generating training and resources that, that mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that there isn't the demand for. And then we've got to invest the time into writing those courses and making them fully available. And I'm actually doing this all as a, as a terrible plug for Universe HPC, which is run by Neil Chu Hong, a, a long-time co-conspirator of mine. Uh, and that's exactly what they're doing. So, so to, to develop uh, master's courses and continuous professional development courses for, for RSEs. They are not the only ones working on that. There's EPSRC funded a, a bid quite recently to, to do that. So okay. there is efforts going into it. Mm -hmm. Annika, I think you look like you. Y yes, I would <laughs> like to add something on. Um, so I personally find it very helpful to have courses, and I like them a lot, especially when I can do them in my free time. And no, free time not necessarily, as in free time, free time, more when I'm free to do the courses. I think for me there is an aspect that a course can't capture, and that is real-life experience. And I think... For me, there should be in groups opportunities where people can take on the responsibilities that they want on a small scale. So let's mm. say if um, I want to become a project manager, I have the opportunity to go with somebody else who knows what they're doing, and I can be that project manager. If I want to become a line manager, I have small scale opportunities where I can try and see what it means to be a line manager. because. Quite often, when you are new and you set out on your journey, you don't necessarily know what you get yourself into. And I don't think that a course will teach you that. I know from experience mm -hmm. that the first time I was a line manager, I was fa faced with a health situation that I had not expected at all. It's nothing that I can learn from a course necessarily, and it also differs from institute to organization what the right response in the situation is. So mm -hmm. I do feel that there is a need for letting people train, letting people have the opportunity in small scale mm -hmm. okay. exposure. So letting people get gather their own experiences, basically, in addition to training. Okay. So uh, career opportunities. Well, I think that's a can of worms a little bit because there was a session this morning. Uh, I think it was Charles Lee who and uh, Melanie Langer, and I think particularly the latter showed a survey where satisfaction, so people seem to be very happy what they do, but not how they get recognized, and uh, recognized in terms of academically, uh, but also recognized in terms of pay, right? So what is it that we can do to make the job of research software engineer more attractive in terms of these points? Michael. Well, um, from UK Rights perspective, we are trying to improve things from our side. Um, so we signed the uh, technician's commitment, which is for research technical professionals uh, and includes research software engineers, um, and trying to push for uh, culture change where we can. The, when we did run the uh, research software engineering fellowships, we um, tried to place um, importance on host support for research software engineers. From our side, uh, we are um, trying to do things where we can. We advertise the eligibility of research software engineers to be PIs and co-Is on grants. Um, we have research software engin engineers on our strategic advisory team and we invite them to be on our panels. Um, mm -hmm. So we try and change the culture where we uh, are able to. Right. Yeah, Jennifer. 
So I understand, I think what UKRA is, is trying to do is fantastic and it's long, slow work because it's changing deep cultures. What about if um, software engineers were to be co-eyes on projects or even PI? PIs of UKRI projects. I think that would change things. I want to mm. give you an example. So I'm running a project at the moment. It's just starting. It's got Leverhulme funding. We went to the Leverhulme because the Leverhulme um, will do risky ideas. And that has got somebody from the software engineering team named as an RA, RA but they will in fact be a co-I because their contribution, the way in which that they, the tools that they will develop, the way in which they will visualize, the way in which they, they will engage with us, is absolutely crucial to making this complicated arts, humanities, and science project on animal emotions work. Now, we couldn't put them in as co-I, but in mm. the minds of everybody in the team, they are co-I. They could have been PI, actually. So, RSEs can be PIs and co-Is, and there's quite a lot of crossover mm. that have been on, on UKRI on bits. But it's a big difference between the policy that is written and what is allowed and mm. what the academic culture allows. Okay, thank you. And that's the big difference. Between. So EPSRC you know, absolutely deserve uh, a huge amount of gratitude from this community for the, for the far-sightedness, especially of Susan Morell back in the day. You know, we really saw the importance of RSE and really got behind it. So, but getting that culture to trickle down through not just the, the senior management in universities, but actually what it, where I find it really gets stuck is sort of middle management, where people kind of are looking at a policy document and not really taking it in and thinking more about, well, 20 years ago when I first did this, it was like this. That's the culture, that's the part of the culture that we're really struggling with now. So I think if we can change that, then, then we will see a big change. Can we talk about how that happened? Yeah, of course we can. Yeah. Oh, um, I was just going to add that um, there are a few areas in UK, right, and we're talking about uh, RSEs over the next 10 years. And the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research mm -hmm. Council um, did champion and I think it, that's going to be picked up to a greater extent by the other councils. Talking to people in the different councils, it was highlighted in the Gold Acre review that uh, there's more for MRC to do um, with research software engineers, and the National Environment Research Council, NERC, were also interested in reducing their barriers as well in the future. Okay, I think uh, I'm coming a little bit back to this generalist uh, versus specialist model, so uh, sorry if I'm hopefully not boring everybody. But the reason I'm mentioning this is because we want scientists to work closely with research software engineers on a par level, right? So we want them to be, as you, Jennifer, said, co-authors. But isn't sort of the fact that we have generalist team that everybody can go to, isn't there a tendency that they get treated more like a service department? They serve my purpose very well, and I'm very happy with them, but because they're consultants, so basically I just dump a pile of requirements on that table and then that's, I'm going to go away and that's what they do. Isn't that kind of strengthening that culture? Sorry if I landed an Easter egg there. I don't think we tend to get too involved in how the university sets up their, their research software engineer team. We don't really mind how it, it's a, you know, a core team or if it's divided mm -hmm. generalists or specialists. For me, it's not so much the question between generalist and specialism. I think it's more the how does work get done quickly. I think if there is money to be had and spent, I would think that in a generalist and specialist approach, you're more likely to succeed. But I'm not sure that it necessarily facilitates the exploitation. So if someone is set on mm. exploiting RSE teams to shortcut recruitment or whatever it is, they will do that no matter whether they're generalists or specialists. So for me, the two aren't necessarily connected. So I was going to say, I, yeah, I think it, it, I agree completely. I, I think it comes down more to the personality of the person than, than the, whether you're a generalist in a group mm. or a specialist embedded in, in, as an RSE. Now, if you look at the people who teach, that who treat um, RSE groups as being a service and not sort of, not at the same level as themselves, then I, I'd, mm. I'd say look at their PhD students and other people, and you'll probably find that they treat everybody the same. So it's more, more the person than the, whether you're an RSE group or not. Mm -hmm. Another question regarding uh, career paths, and I'm not saying that the private sector is better because I worked in the private sector and uh, 
career paths usually tend to look like you climb up the ladder from a software engineer to senior engineer to principal engineer, then you become a project manager, then you become a people manager, and then you become a general manager, and at some stage you might become even the CTO. So there is sort of the classical path of Engineering seems to be, I start you know, with engineering and then I go up and the further I go up, the further I go away from technology. Do you see there's room for creating career paths for people who are, want to be more on the technical side? And how would we do this actually with the current funding model rather than the classical path that we saw in the industry that from engineer to manager? We've been hearing from different universities around the country about what is happening with uh, career structures. For research software engineers, we're seeing um, a lot of the first wave of the fellowships. The people who got those, some of them have been going into professorship kind of positions. Um, but if you're talking more on the sort of technical side of things, for research technical professionals more generally, um, there are some cases where there's been managing new groups or putting uh, new positions in place um, for mm. these people in some universities. So I think things are slowly changing. Yeah, I guess in my mind, I see it like if I write three grant proposals and they all have web development and include that I trained somebody in web development, why not have one person to all and basically be a super web developer and therefore that's money that's spent and over time the costs are basically repaying themselves as people are trained up and mm -hmm. so taking money out from money that is grant funding that's coming into groups to support specialist roles could be one option. The other option that I see is well we do pay people to provide us with laptops and we do pay people for compute infrastructure so why not pay for people that are specialists in some or shape. Okay, I think we're coming to the end now, and I think you're glad to know that there will be a pub at the end, uh, sort of, a, where, where, where was it going to be? Sort of somewhere near the riverside. But before we end, there's one final question. So in 10 years' time, we are sitting here, possibly in Newcastle, possibly in this auditorium. So what do you think we should have achieved by then? So where will RSE be? I'm trying to work out whether I'll be retired by then, or whether you'll be able to hold it. <laughs> well, I will be. <laughs> So in 10 years' time, right, so in the last 10 years, we've gone from the, I remember the very first senior policy person I talked to about RSE, I told them about the plans that we, we had, uh, there was a handful of us at that time, and they said, it's a lovely idea, but it's not gonna, you're not going to change it, right? And that was about 2000, at the end of 2012. So in the last 10 years, we've gone from that to, to this, where we have, like, hundreds of people sitting there in a far too steeply tiered, tiered <laughs> seating arrangement it is, yeah. up to the top. And it's not just this room, it's rooms like this in uh, well, countries all around the world. There's at least nine, maybe 10 national associations now. Mm -hmm. um, so we've, we've taken huge, huge steps forward in recognition. So I think the next 10 years is about sort of hammering that down so that it's not seen as like, oh, well, haven't, haven't you done well in building this community? It's just part of the, the infrastructure of the university. So people come in, they get recruited onto RSE, RSE jobs. There, there's a clear um, path all the way through that you know, takes you right up to the professorial level, which then we do have, but far, far too few of them. You can do it on the technical front. You won't have to take on the, the, all of the people management and all of those other mm -hmm. things as well. And it will just be a standard bit of academia. And, and I think that's, it, that's possible in 10 years. Okay. Maybe if I can, um, maybe we could, yeah, uh, use the 10 years to develop more of a sort of common language between uh, research software engineers and researchers themselves. Maybe it is just also with me having very recently sort of joined this space. I'm still trying to understand in my own experiences too, like what is a research software engineer? And what does that communication look like between a resource software engineer and a researcher? And it seems like maybe there's still some work that needs to be done in, yes, establishing a language in terms of 
what are the expectations of both parties and where do they expect each other to meet, yeah, create and deliver a project. And yes, just in general, how should that relationship look like? Mm -hmm. okay. I do have a thought, actually. I mean, I, I would like to see much more flow across universities through software engineering. So with um, colleagues stepping in and out of um, departments into software engineering and back again, so that when you, if you were to talk to arts and humanities people, they would have a better understanding of what's possible and what you could do and vice versa. And that would be the same in other um, faculties as well. Mm -hmm. um, it seems pie in the sky, but I, I think it's really achievable. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Micro. Um, yeah, so more uh, flexibility, like you were saying. Um, embedding the uh, research software engineering in like more universities and across all the research councils. In the UK, I think more evolution over the next 10 years rather than revolution um, of what is done. Perhaps more internationally, you'll see more people and more countries pick up the idea of research software engineer, I think, as, as you go forward for the next 10 years. I guess for me, it's really driving more diversity in the community trying to get more people in, trying to understand how they drive and to support them in their careers so that they can answer to requests made by researchers in the way they feel more comfortable. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for um, joining this panel. And I've got a bunch of questions Mark just told me. So. <laughs> 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 Right, okay, right from the top. The public-private salary gap. Okay, well, that's something we haven't touched on. Um, the public-private salary gap for RSEs is a recruitment retainment problem. Mm -hmm. It is. How can we tackle this so public university RSEs can thrive in the next 10 years? Well, that is a funding issue, so uh, I'm looking at the people who are responsible for that. Michael. Well, yeah, it is difficult and you know we'll do what we can but we'll see <laughs> <laughs> okay i should say that it, you know the private sector working in london of course you uh, sometimes get confronted with rather large salaries particularly for those people who have the privilege or perhaps not to work in the fintech sector but i think sir, we should also realize that uh, people tend to idealize private sector a little bit too much if i may put something in there um, because I worked sort of you know also companies that don't pay these absurd salaries but hey Simon it, it's a funding question but it's uh, not the UKRI they're the people who are going to set salaries it's the universities that set the salaries so it's really getting the message through there and there is one endeavor to do that which is um, Schmidt Futures Schmidt, Schmidt Future possibly uh, and they're paying more like industry level standards for RSEs in a number of universities in the US and in Cambridge here in the UK Mm -hmm. How that goes, I think, will be really interesting. And they've, and they've had, and I've talked to them, and there's been a lot of problems persuading them that people like research software engineers should be paid potentially more than professors, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed. Or perhaps well, everybody should pay, be paid more in academia, but uh, well, here's an idea. <laughs> 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 Do I hear agreement? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, career paths for RSEs is a burning issue still. There is a hard stop on those who want to stay technical. So what needs to happen in the next 10 years to solve this? I, I think that goes back to the question that we discussed a little bit earlier, so the career path that folks in some organizations, right, where there's a career path for technical managers uh, or technical specialists and managers. Anyway, so over to the panel. I guess for me it's largely opening up opportunities for technical staff to bring in their um, abilities, so making sure that there is not just the job description but also the um, carved out problems within the groups that are specifically assigned to people that want to be technical. Mm. Yeah, making sure that there's opportunity for them to be engaged. But, I mean, the increasing number of software engineers, so 10 years ago, there were, would have been, I don't think it would have filled this room, but it now does, and more, 
does that not automatically lead to some form of specializations, which might then also lead to a career path in the next 10 years? Do you see that is likely to happen? or? I think it needs a bit of encouragement <laughs> because <laughs> if people are spread out across different projects, you don't necessarily see what other people are working on and then you mm. find it harder to work out where the synergies are and trying to have this group identity or this specialist identity. I think it needs to be acknowledged that that's what's happening because otherwise you don't feel valued. I'm reading the next one, which is, does the future of RZ groups look more like an academic research department or more like a software development group in industry? <coughs> hmm, that's an interesting one. Right, uh, what Jennifer. What do people want? <laughs> because I, I, I had been thinking, actually, without being part of this community, that it sounds like an academic department, research department, and so actually mm. the same career development opportunity should be available. But I suppose the question is, what do people want? Mm. Now, I think there is this kind of oscillating between how do we identify ourselves, are we more... Is the pendulum swinging more in the direction of academia or is it more swinging into the direction of software development? So, uh, like I said earlier on, my answer to these questions is both. Um, so, we see already um, some RSE groups, some embedded RSE groups especially, are the ones that get much more involved in that sort of early stages of research, getting into the really sort of grungy, researchy problems. And other ones are dealing more at the end with the how you get the results out to and, mm. and, and, and how you sort of package up and, and distribute the, the software that's been, been written. So really, it will depend, as, as you were saying, on what's want and what's needed. But I think what we'll find is both are needed. One more. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and so we'll need them both available in universities. I've got room for one more question, sorry about the others that we can't touch on, but how do we build bridges with humanities departments that are alienated from IT and RSE teams? I can answer that. But, okay. um, it has to be education, actually. It has to be. Mm. I mean, the, with um, the RSE team here, we are, have applied for funding. We are trying to upskill humanities. We are trying to start a conversation about the fut future of arts and humanities with software engineers. There's so much, it's so varied. Uh, there is, there are, um, but actually just working together more would solve all sorts of problems. There are misunderstandings, there are things that people need to share, there are things need to, that mm. they need to learn about each other. And that is one thing. I think the HRC is trying to, to upskill um, people. I would love to see that happen. There's a, a big focus in the AHRC delivery plan about um, digital side of things, and they're keenly um, aware of, of the needs in that area. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the panel. Thank you very much for the, for the stimulating discussion here. And thank you very much, everybody here in the room, for staying on until late, until the last minute. And I hope you all enjoy a very nice conference. Thank you.